Good vision doesn't necessarily mean good eye health. Keeping you connected to your surroundings, the importance of eye health. Tonight, on call with the Prairie Duck. Hello and welcome to On Call with Prairie Duck. I'm Dr. Andrew Ellsworth, tonight's Prairie Duck host. Thank you for joining us. Tonight's topic is eye health, the eyes. Joining us tonight in the studio are Dr. Elizabeth Atchison and Dr. Andrea Bordewick from Ophthalmology Limited. Dr. Bordewick and Dr. Atchison, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Thanks for having, having us. us. So, um, Dr. Atchison, if you don't mind telling us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I am a Sioux Falls girl, grew up in Sioux Falls, graduated from Sioux Falls, Lincoln, um, then went to St. Olaf for undergrad, Northwestern in Chicago for med school, um, Mayo Clinic for my general ophthalmology training, but then I really enjoyed retinal surgery, so went on for another two years in that. I have been back at Ophthalmology Limited now for, it's hard to believe, but five years. Yeah, the time flies, doesn't it? And this is not your first time on the show. No, I think it was three years ago when I was last on. Welcome back, thanks for joining us again. Dr. Bordewijk, how about you? Yeah, so I'm, I'm also from uh, Sioux Falls. I'm an O'Gorman grad. Um, and then I, I stayed in South Dakota. I did my undergrad and my medical school at the University of South Dakota. And then I headed out east. I went to Penn State for my ophthalmology residency. And then I did a one-year fellowship in cornea refractive surgery um, in Portland, Oregon. And then I finally worked my way back here. I'm, I'm the freshest member of the team at Ophthalmology Limited, so I just started working in September. Well, welcome back to South Dakota. Thank you. I'm happy to be back. Awesome. Uh, before we start our conversation, we invite you, our audience, to submit your questions now about eye health. Viewers can contact us three ways. Call 1-888-376-6225, send an email to ask at prairiedoc.org, or ask on our Prairie Doc Facebook page. We will work to answer as many of your questions as possible given the time available. Sometimes we receive more questions than we can cover and we apologize if we do not get to your question. To encourage you to ask early, all questions asked in the first 20 minutes will be entered into a drawing for one of our Prairie Doc gift items. The winner will be announced at the end of this program. Your question will remain anonymous, but please provide contact information when you submit your question if you would like to be considered for the prize. So Dr. Atchison, you are a retinal spe specialist. What does that mean? So the retina is the whole back part of the eye and its job is to collect light to then send to the brain. Um, so the entire back of the eye is called the retina. The very center part, the part that you use for reading, for recognizing faces, for detail work is called the macula. And so the macula, which is something we talk about a lot with like macular degeneration, um, is part of the retina, which makes it kind of confusing nomenclature wise. And so um, what are some of the problems that you deal with typically then? Um, so retinal tears or detachments, which are something that's just a bad luck deal. Um, some people are put together in such a way that their gel is adherent to the retina and can pull a little hole or tear and create a detachment. Um, around here especially, we have a population that tends to be more affected by macular degeneration, which is something where the macula, that center part of vision that's so important, the cells can gradually become less healthy as they get older um, and threaten vision in a, in a variety of ways. People with systemic issues, particularly diabetes, um, the retina is very dependent on good blood flow. So anything that damages your blood flow, which um, diabetes is something that does that, can really affect the health of the retina. You know, you mentioned we, it, it does seem like we see a, or hear a lot of, about people having macular degeneration around here. Why would that be? Macular degeneration very disproportionately affects people who are um, white European and that is who tended to settle this part of the country that tends to be more of the population we have and those are the people who are hardest hit. And then of course age is a risk factor too? Correct. Yep. And we people are healthy and grow old around here so so you can have more problems with macular degeneration then. Exactly. As you get older you tend to have more problems. And is there anything we can do about that? 
The biggest thing is not smoking. Smoking really accelerates the formation of macular degeneration. Getting regular eye exams can be healthy can be helpful because if you have enough changes due to macular degeneration, there are some eye vitamins that help slow the process down. And then things that help your overall health, you know, keeping your blood pressure, um, blood sugar, just being systemically healthy is helpful overall. And I suppose I, I since we're talking about macular degeneration, how might someone even know they have it? What do they experience? So the classic change is either a missing portion of the center of the vision or that things start to look wavy. So you look at telephone poles, blinds, things that should be straight. And if they start to get warped or kind of a fun house effect, that is one of the symptoms that can be from macular degeneration. Sure. Well, I'm guessing we'll have a few questions about that that we'll dive into more detail in a little bit. I look forward to it. Dr. Bordewick, um, you are a corneal specialist. Yes. So what do you see? What do you do? Yeah, so I'm kind of a little bit the opposite of uh, Dr. Atchison. My world's in the front of the eye. So the cornea is kind of the, I, we can think of it as the clear window into your eye. So where the white or the sclera of the eye needs our colored iris, in front of that is our cornea. And so a lot of my job is to try to keep that clear. So there's a lot of different things that can cause the cornea to become cloudy. And some of that can be even as simple as, you know, um, dry eyes. Dry eyes can make the, the tear film and whatnot over the cornea not reflect the light as well onto the retina. So, you know, the cornea and then the lens and the eye, which we talk about more so with cataracts, and I deal a lot with that too, they're basically the two refractive parts of our eye that that light hits and then it will help it focus onto the retina so we can see well. So there's different things that I can do, you know, with a cornea in terms of even refractive surgery. So that's when we're talking about LASIK or PRK. You can do things to reshape the cornea so that light focuses better and that can limit, you know, your need for glasses. And then like I was saying, you know, the cornea can become cloudy from, you know, one of the more common things I see is Fuchs corneal dystrophy. <laughs> and with that, it's, a, it's an issue with the cells on the very inner layer of the cornea. And they just stop working as well over time. And there is a hereditary component to that too. And it can cause the cornea to become more swollen. And it can get to a point where that makes things very cloudy, especially, you know, maybe when you wake up in the morning and eventually throughout the day. And so there's cornea transplants that we can do to replace those cells. And um, just a wide variety of things I see, you know, with the cornea itself. And then again, I do a lot with, you know, the lens and the eye. So people who have cataracts, um, you know, will go in and do surgery and replace that with a clear lens. So a lot of what I do is trying to make those windows in the eye more clear. Do we do some corneal transplants here in South Dakota? We do. Yeah, we do all sorts of cornea transplants. Anything from, so a full thickness cornea transplant is almost like a cookie cutter, you know, punch out where you're replacing the whole cornea. That's more so something that we would do if there was a a lot of scarring throughout the entire cornea, you know, that you just can't see through that, then we may need to replace the whole thing. Uh, but then again, now it's gotten so specialized that if the issue is just with certain layers, that we can go in and, and replace even the thinnest layer of cells, and it's a much quicker recovery for patients and, you know, um, a better visual outcome than having to replace the whole thing, which we used to have to do even for issues that were just that inner layer. So it's amazing, you know, how far yeah. it's come, but there's all sorts of transplants that we do uh, depending on what the issue is. Well, what a great opportunity to have uh, two highly trained specialists in two small parts <laughs> of the one of the smallest organs right here on the show to help answer our questions. And I blinked, and now there's a bunch of questions here from our callers. So. Uh, we can get going on that. Here, a 67-year-old caller from Brookings asks, why it is more difficult to go from reading or computer work to distance vision than when I was younger? Yeah, so I mean, that can be a variety of, of things. So for one, a lot of people have more issues with up-close vision, you know, as we get older. When we're young, like I was saying earlier, you know, we focus with our, our cornea. That usually, unless you have an issue with your cornea, will stay, you know, fairly similar throughout your life in its shape. But the lens and the eye will change. And so we kind of lose, once we hit around age 40, everyone's a little different, but you can start to lose some of that capability of the lens 
to shape, you know, to change shape. And so it can't zoom in anymore. So you start sometimes needing a different glasses prescription. You know, for some people, if you didn't require anything far away, now you need to put on reading glasses and you're kind of adjusting, you know, in between that. Or um, some people who may have been more farsighted uh, could kind of accommodate through that with their lens and see well far away. And then as they get older, you know, and that lens doesn't do that, they may need glasses all the time when they never did. And so that's, you know, one thing. The other thing when going, you know, from reading, uh, say you're focused in reading, sometimes you over accommodate with that lens and you're really focused in that then you try to look far away and you're still, those muscles are kind of spasming that it can make things seem a little blurry at a distance. And then the other thing would be maybe related to just some dryness. You know, as we read, we don't blink as much, and uh, that can change focus, you know, depending on where you're looking to. So be patient with your eyes and, yes. and give them time to focus. Yes. But what, you know, since dry eyes, I'm sure there'll be questions about that. What in general would you guys recommend for, for dry eyes? Yeah, so for dry eyes, you know, it's, it's definitely multifactorial. So for some people, you don't produce as many tears. And one of the go-to things that helps the most for most patients with dryness is just getting more lubrication. So we recommend getting, you know, some eye drops. I recommend against the ones that say kind of get the red away because um, those have some different preservatives and chemicals in them that could make you more dependent on them and get kind of some rebound redness if you're using them all the time. But uh, there's a lot of great, you know, just artificial tears like refresh or sustain or blink. And then if you're using them more than four times a day, I recommend going to a preservative free brand and then you can use those as often. Other things is just your uh, oils. The oil is an important part of your tear film, so your tears may evaporate very quickly if you don't have a good oil component to it. So things that can help with that is just, you know, for, for women or, or men who are wearing makeup, remove makeup, you know, before you go to bed. Doing kind of an eyelid, eyelid wash of your lashes can get rid of any debris in anybody and then heat heat, uh, there's different masks that you can heat up and wear for about 10 minutes at a time and that will loosen up some of the oil glands and keep then uh, you have a better tear foam so your tears don't evaporate as quickly. Same thing if you use a ceiling fan or you know you have heat or you're sitting by fans that can dry the eyes out more. So you know facing those away from you or not having a ceiling fan on at night or things can be helpful as well. Excellent, excellent. Uh, now, I know neither of you specialize in glaucoma, but uh, this caller asked, what are the symptoms for glaucoma that someone should watch for and know when to get checked out? So glaucoma is probably one of the classic reasons to get a yearly eye exam. Yeah. It is one of the classic things that often, unfortunately, you don't have symptoms until it's too late for the classic kind, which is that open angle glaucoma. That's what most people have. and when it gets really bad, you tend to start to lose your side vision, but we love to intervene well before that. There's drops and lasers and a variety of things to keep it under control. Um, there are different parts of glaucoma or different types of glaucoma where your eye pressure can go high suddenly, and that tends to create severe pain, nausea, vomiting, but for the vast majority of people, we hope to pick it up at a yearly eye exam. Which, cause, because you might not have any symptoms. Until it's quite advanced and it's so much easier to intervene before that step. So get your eyes checked. Exactly. All right. Uh, this person from Facebook said, can you have cataract surgery on both eyes at the same time? You know, people come in maybe for a pre-op and they say, well, I'm getting one eye next week and then the other eye two weeks later. Why, why do they do it that way? Yeah, so there, there are scenarios where we'll do them both, you know, in the same day. Oftentimes while we'll separate them is, one, you may learn something from the first eye. Um, our calculations have gotten very good over time, which is great and why so many people after cataract surgery are less dependent on glasses. But sometimes there can be some, you know, surprises that we see and we can then, you know, when we're picking for the other eye, make some adjustments to that. So that's kind of one of the reasons that we do that. The other reason, you know, it gives, um, you know, your eye a little bit of time to heal before, you know, having two eyes that are maybe irritated, kind of recovering from surgery a little bit. Um, and then risk of infection. Uh, luckily that's very low. 
uh, very low to get infection, but if something were to be contaminated, you know, somewhere, yeah. now you're having both eyes kind of opened up at the same time. That being said, there are scenarios where the benefits out, out bay, outweigh the risks. You know, if you're having to put someone deeper under anesthesia or different reasons, um, or maybe it's hard travel-wise or things like that, that, you know, you can usually feel pretty comfortable, you know, moving forward. Like I said, the, the worst thing is infection risk, but that's very low, luckily. Sure. I suppose it's kind of like, why wouldn't you want to have both knees done at the same time? Well, yeah. then you can't walk, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's nice to have one eye to kind of, you know, depend on, you right. know, for a little bit. Yeah. Right. Luckily, the recovery is fast from <laughs> cataract surgery. The retina is one of the most important parts of the eye because it is responsible for the visual processing that turns light energy from photons into three-dimensional images. Prairie Doc reporter Sam Schauer takes us to Vance Thompson Vision to see what can be done when your retina detaches. Dr. Jed Assam is a retina surgeon at Vance Thompson Vision who helps with problems with the retina. The way that I often explain it to patients is it's kind of like a camera. So often what everybody at Vance Thompson Vision is used to is the cataract and refractive side. So those would be what we would consider the lenses of the camera, the optical system that helps focus light. The retina is kind of like your film. Dr. Assam usually sees patients who have retinal detachments. He says the signs of a detachment are new floaters, flashes of light, and a curtain effect where one eye is getting darker than the other. If the retina isn't fixed, it could lead to a loss of sight in the eye. So the longer the retina remains detached uh, from the back of the eye, the more it starts to atrophy, decay, and uh, eventually it will die and all vision capability that it does will be lost. A retina can detach randomly or by a blunt force to the eye and should be fixed as soon as possible. Dr. Assam helps fix the retina with many different procedures, but it always involves putting a gas or oil bubble behind the eye. And we're gonna put a bubble in the eye, and then we utilize different um, techniques, whether it's a freeze treatment or a laser treatment to help glue or tack the retina back down where the hole that was created that caused the retinal detachment. And Dr. Assam says retina surgery is very effective with the retina taking two to four weeks to fully recover. For the general retinal detachment, uh, the repair rate sits right now around 90 to 95 percent for first-time repair success. So um, given the historic trends, it's a really good time and a really good place to be in for that. He also says if new floaters or flashes appear, see an eye care provider right away to make sure a retina isn't detaching. It is definitely recommended that you go see your primary eye specialist and they will often refer you to a retinal specialist to be seen and checked a little bit closer uh, for any holes or tears. If it's um, new floaters and symptoms of flashes then definitely you should be seen absolutely immediately uh, for that. Yeah, it's so important that if you're noticing new new floaters or flashes in your vision or losing some of your vision to get, get seen right away. And you can certainly start with your regular eye doctor, right? Um, Dr. Atchison, and, and as a retinal specialist, um, what can you do to help people? You know, depending on what the problem is, if it's a tear or a small detachment, oftentimes we can treat it with laser and clinic. Um, there's as Dr. Asim pointed out, just a variety of increasing options for surgical repair as well. And, you know, success rates are improving all the time. That's great. I, my uh, father-in-law one, one time had to have that done and, you know, and he laid on the, in the couch sideways for a bunch of time, you know, because the air bubble in there. Is that still that's, how they do that? That's still how we do it. Um, so oftentimes you're talking about a vitrectomy surgery, which is one of the more common ways that we repair retinal detachments. But we go in and take out all the gel that's causing the problem, flatten the retina back down, laser it into place, but then we need something to hold it in place. So we put some gas in as a splint, but gas being a bubble that floats that has to be against the part of the retina that's affected, which means you have to be on one side or the other generally for that first week after surgery, which is by far the hardest part for folks. Just fascinating what, what can be done. 
Uh, we are not even halfway through the show and we already have to go to lightning round here. So we're gonna see if we can get how many through this. Uh, uh, Caller from Rapid City asks, are there any new medications for dry eye macular degeneration? Quick, quick synopsis between dry eye and, and, and the other version of macular degeneration. So dry macular degeneration is where you don't have an abnormal blood vessel complicating things. Um, wet macular degeneration has those blood vessels, which is what we've been treating with injections for about 15 years. In this last year, we've gotten two new FDA-approved medications, Sifovri and Isorve, which slow down the progression of the bad kind of dry macular degeneration or geographic atrophy. Very good. Uh, this call from Yankton recently had LASIK eye surgery, but is still having vision problems. So she is wondering if she is able to have LASIK surgery a second time. Yes, you can. Um, I mean, every person's a little bit different, so you definitely need to have you know a full workup to make sure that everything's safe with your cornea. Every time that we do LASIK, we make it a little bit thinner. Um, so that we can reshape things. And so unless you had a, a thin cornea to begin with and um, you know we're kind of borderline, you might not have enough give room to, ha to have it again. But for the vast majority of people, if they need a touch up, they can. Uh, you, we usually wait though. So it sounds like this you know, viewer had this very recently. It can fluctuate. So we usually wait you know, months before we would consider doing that and just encourage them to keep using you know, some artificial tears and you know, kind of be a little patient with the results too. But certainly um, you can do touch ups. Yeah, from my understanding, you want to let things settle, and exactly. sometimes it still might improve. Yet. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Fuchs epithelial dystrophy, this person from Facebook asks, what are the newest advancement for corneal transplant options to address Fuchs epithelial dystrophy, and are they an option in your clinic? Yeah, so um, there's new options all of the time, which has been what's the most exciting. Uh, so when we're talking about the partial thickness transplants, we have a DSEC and DMEC. DSEC, the S is the stroma, which is the thicker part of our cornea, so it's a little bit of a thicker transplant. Now oftentimes we'll offer DMEC, which is just that inner layer of cells, very thin, um, and so it's an exact anatomical replacement for what we're taking away. And um, so that's really usually a go-to option. There are some people who are candidates where we can just, if it's very central, we can just remove the center layer of cells and some of your more healthy ones may migrate in and kind of be able to avoid a transplant. Now there's a lot of studies going on with actually um, implanting cells uh, with an injection. And so that's, you know, where the future may be going, you know, in, in, some, in some scenarios. And so it's very exciting, but certainly I'm keeping up with, with everything where I trained. Uh, that was really where they first started doing DMEC transplants, who I trained under. So um, very in touch with everything new that's going on, but it's very exciting. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, and, and to be clear, these transplants were mostly talking about transplants from cadaver tissue. Yes. And so people donating their organs, and so a plug in to be an organ donor and, and put that on your driver's license. Absolutely. Because you can give someone the gift of vision. Yeah, it's really beautiful. And a lot of times families like to reach out to those donors, you know, to say thank you and, and everything. And um, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Uh, what would qualify as heavy lids that impact the vision? When is a blepharoplasty needed to treat it? So typically what patients are interested in is when Medicare will cover it, when their insurance will cover it. Um, certainly they could do it anytime it's um, safe otherwise, but there are, they have to do a specific uh, visual field test um, to check the peripheral vision in a certain way. And so oftentimes you can't tell yourself, but if you're concerned about it, certainly checking in with your um, eye care provider and getting those tests can help elucidate whether you're a candidate for insurance covered blepharoplasty. Yeah, and of course we're talking about when that eyelid is drooping and, and starting to affect your vision. And the, your vision's so important for so many things and, 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 and see for your balance too. I've had patients that, you know, they, if, if they're not seeing as well, they have, their balance is poor and then they might fall and break something or what. So it's, it's a good, good option for some people. Uh, this person from an email said, I was put on a dual eye drop that essentially robbed me or what vision I have. 
According to my ophthalmologist, it resulted in roughing the cornea. She put me on mural ointment and mural eye drops, which I've been using for months. So far, my vision has improved to the point where I can drive and watch TV. When will vision improve to the starting point? And when they say starting point, I'm guessing they mean back to completely normal. And I, you know, there's a lot of details with this case that I'm sure we don't have. Yeah, yeah. So but. I certainly would need a little bit more information. <clears throat> it sounds like if the Miro is what's helping, you know, this viewer the most, that's kind of like a sodium chloride, almost salt. A solution and so that helps in disorders of the cornea that is causing some swelling because it helps pull you know some fluid out of the cornea um, and so there's different causes of that oftentimes it has to do with issues with the inner layer of cells like we were talking about earlier where they can you know whether it's from Fuchs or if it's from you know maybe they've had surgeries or some medication or whatnot that's damaged any cells um, but so so that helps and I'd have to know a little bit more about you know what caused the issue and whatnot um, but I would encourage them to keep using those drops if it helps uh, and patients who have you know, swelling of their cornea, um, sometimes also hair dryers, <laughs> fans, actually like the opposite of what we say in dry eye, can give some symptomatic relief in mornings too. You know, I might add that, you know, if, if, if someone is, is un, unhappy or uncomfortable with their treatment or their progress, I would encourage them to keep working with their, their doctor, but you can certainly get a second opinion, and, and I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I don't mind if someone gets a second opinion because that way, you know, they, they're, they're getting all their options. Absolutely. Uh, this person asks, is there anything that can be done about floaters in vision? So floaters are something that a lot of people see. They have to do with irregularities in the vitreous gel, which is behind that lens of the eye where cataracts appear, but in front of the retina. And they cast these shadows on the eye that go anywhere from a little bit annoying to, to really bothersome for patients. There have been a bunch of studies over the years just because this is enough of a problem that people want it dealt with. They've tried some different drops, some vitamins, some lasers. So far, the only surgery we have to get rid of the floaters is vitrectomy where we take all the gel out. Yeah. It's actually quite effective at reducing the bothersome effects of floaters, but it's a fairly big surgery. And so depending on the risk factors for the patient, sometimes it can make sense and sometimes it's best to be avoided, but that would be the option. Sure. Well, speaking of, uh, there was a follow-up for this person said, uh, for floors and I was recommended vitreous health one a day for six months. And they're curious if there's any research or proof behind this helping. So it doesn't there's sound like- There's some very early data for it, um, but nothing conclusive yet. Sure, sure. Uh, this person has it possible to get rid of the halos that have come after cataract surgery because you know especially they're noticing during night driving so some of it um, some of it depends on what's causing it you know sometimes you can get halos that come back and it might have to do with a film forming behind the lens so in about 25 30 percent of patients uh, they can get a film that forms in the capsule that holds your lens in place and they may complain of symptoms of glares coming back or halos. So in that scenario, there's a very simple, you know, procedure in clinic where we can we can laser that away. Um, but it, that would be if that was that individual's problem. Sometimes it has to do with just the surface itself being, you know, more dry. Anytime, like I said, that tear film's impacted, light can be more bothersome. And so definitely, you know, treating, you know, any underlying. If you've had um, you know, multifocal lenses, which can be really great, they can give you distance, middle, near. One of the trade-offs with those is that they have some rings around them, and so patients may, as a trade-off of having that you know, vision from far away to near, they might notice more glare or halos. So some of it depends on you know, getting in, getting an eye exam, seeing you know, what the issue is that's causing it, if there's something that could be done to improve it. This person asked, does Occuvite work? Have there been studies that found it to actually be helpful? So Occuvite is a general brand, but in particular, the AREDS2 formula, it stands for the Age-Related Eye Disease Study. It was a huge study done by National Institutes of Health looking at what we can do for dry macular degeneration. And for people with at least moderate dry macular degeneration, it does slow the disease process down. Excellent. 
Well, keratoconus is a common but relatively unknown eye disease caused by frequent eye rubbing. Prairie Doc reporter Sam Schauer takes us to Vance Thompson Vision to ask how we can avoid keratoconus, a disease that affects one in 300 Americans. Dr. Brent Kramer works as a surgeon at Vance Thompson Vision, and he warns people about the dangers of eye rubbing and keratoconus. And if you rub your eye a lot, you can cause something called keratoconus. And that's where there's a thinning and a weakening of the cornea, and the cornea protrudes or bulges out. Dr. Kramer says keratoconus is very common today with one in 300 people in America having it. It causes vision loss and irregular astigmatism, which he says can be tougher to treat with regular methods. So when you hear and think of astigmatism, you should think the cornea is shaped a little bit more like a football instead of a baseball. And usually you can put a pair of glasses or contact lenses in front of the cornea that corrects that irregular shape. With keratoconus, you get irregular astigmatism, and so it's like a football with a bulge in it. And as you can imagine, that's really tough to treat with glasses or contacts. Keratoconus can start as young as late teens and can cause terrible damage to the cornea if left unchecked. Unfortunately, if keratoconus gets worse, it can cause scarring of the cornea and even cause the cornea to become white or gray from that scarring, and that can't be corrected with a contact lens. And so that's when we look at doing something like a corneal transplant. Dr. Kramer says eye rubbing is the number one culprit for this disease, as eye rubbing can cause prescriptions to change and eye pressure to shoot up exponentially. Normal eye pressure, let's say, is you know, somewhere between 10 and 20. Eye pressure can go up higher in the, well into the hundreds when you rub your eye, even, even to a thousand sometimes. Dr. Kramer says if your eye is itchy, itch around your eye instead of rubbing. So what I do is I grab um, take the skin and pinch it to a bone. And so the middle corners of the eye can rub typically in allergies or dryness. And then I just kind of squeeze that middle finger and go like this. If the eyelids itch, I'd grab that eyelid and pull it down on the bone around the eye and can do that. Dr. Kramer asks people who rub their eyes to think why they do it and to try the new methods to avoid having keratoconus. So if you're an eye rubber, I want you to stop and think about why am I rubbing it. Am I rubbing it just because it, you know, it's the end of a long day and it's a habit or the eyes feel sore or strained or is it something like itching or, um, or blurring or something that we need, you should see your eye doctor for to treat? Well, that's certainly good advice for us not to rub our eyes. You know, in general, what are some other things you recommend for our eye health or to avoid or to do? Big thing is not smoking. Um, like so many things in the body, it's very important. Um, keeping your blood pressure and blood sugar under good control are also incredibly helpful. Yeah, I would say uh, for contact lens wearers, you know, making sure that you're not sleeping in your contact lenses or over wearing them. You know, some people try to extend it out a little bit longer, but it's putting the eyes at risk for infection in those scenarios because you're just getting less oxygen and flow to the cornea. So just taking, you know, good care of your contact lenses if, if you wear those. Somewhere in here, there was a question from someone wondering about any supplements uh, to help with vision and, and eye health. Really, you know, the vitamins A-Reds, too, is the, the one with the greatest data behind it. Okay. Yeah, excellent. This caller from Wyoming was recently diagnosed with NAION, non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, and continues to have vision problems. He is wondering if there are any possible treatment for this condition. So that is a condition where part of the optic nerve stops getting the blood flow that it needs to thrive. Um, and unfortunately, like so many other issues, like a stroke where neural tissue is deprived of oxygen for a period of time, it often doesn't come back all the way. But working with his primary care to make sure his blood pressure is under optimal control, oftentimes if it dips too low, particularly at night, that can be a risk factor for it even happening to the other eye. Yeah, excellent. Uh, this person asks, how do you treat a cyst on the lower lid of the eye? So I'm thinking here styes and, you know, uh, ch uh, ch how do you pronounce that again? <laughs> We say it different ways, I yeah. think, like a chalazia. That's what that's I would how say. I, yeah. That's how I usually okay. say it, but yeah. you, you hear a it sty. different ways. Yeah. A sty, yeah. 
Um, so if, it, if it's that, that's more related to kind of a localized inflammation, oftentimes due to a blocked oil gland along your eyelids. Uh, the number one thing that you can do even just from home is heat. You know, in those scenarios, heat will help open up that clogged gland and help release, you know, some of that um, inflammation and sometimes you'll get some drainage from it. Uh, there's other things that we can do, steroids, steroid injections, um, or to remove it. And that would be the same. You can also just get a cyst. And if it is, you know, kind of uh, looks like that and benign in nature, a lot of times you could leave it if it's not bothersome. But if it's causing a lot of symptoms of irritation or things, there's ways that they can be removed too. But I would say just getting in, having it evaluated to see what exactly it is, and then you can go kind of from there of what the management would be. This person says, my pressures have been super high ever since I had COVID. Dry as well. Uh, dry eyes, I suppose they are talking about. My body rejected plugs, unfortunately. So, you know, sometimes if someone has dry eyes, they'll insert plugs to help keep the moisture in the eyes. I have no peripheral vision and MRI was negative. Any other suggestions? So their pressures have been super high, I guess, and dry eyes from COVID. Do you see many complications from COVID typically? It's not, it, not, a, not a ton, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, certainly with high pressures and loss of peripheral vision, I'm very worried about glaucoma. Hmm. Um, right. Yeah. So right. getting evaluated would be very important. Absolutely. Yeah. And from a from a dryness standpoint, like we talked about earlier, just trying, you know, different tiers. Um, you know, there's more that we can be done with plugs. Sometimes we can even cauterize, you know, that area. And then you don't have a foreign, you know, body in there blocking it if that is what caused the irritation for this individual. But there's certainly a lot of things that can be done, you know, for dry eye and just getting in and talking to your provider about it. But more importantly or urgently in this scenario would be addressing the eye pressures. Yeah. This caller has had a lens replacement, had blurry spots that haven't gone away and it's been over a year. Will these go away with time or is there anything that can, they can do to help them go away or should they follow up with their doctor? So I would definitely say follow up with your doctor. Yeah. You know, what are these spots? They might be floaters, you know, that sometimes you remove the cataract and now you have a clearer view, you know, and you notice more of those floaters that maybe you didn't before. Or it could be like we talked about before, sometimes a film forms behind that lens and there's laser procedure that we can do to impact that. Some people notice a light reflecting off the edge of their lens. That usually gets better over time, you know, for most people. Uh, sometimes an eye drop that makes the pupil smaller can help with that, but it really depends on what these spots are and you know what they're doing. And so definitely getting in and being evaluated, they'd be able to get the best course of action. You know, cataracts are so common, and it's maybe you just live long enough, you're going to have cataracts at some point. Is there a, a timing recommendation on when to have cataract surgery, or can you do it multiple times if you need to anyway? So really it's a one, a one and done, you know, scenario. You could always replace the lens if say, you know, you had a lens and it was off or something, you can replace it in that scenario. But once the cataract's out, it doesn't come back. Uh, so that, from that standpoint, it's just a one-time surgery, you know, in your eye. Um, in terms of when, it, everyone's a little bit different. You know, for most people, they're around, you know, 60, 65, um, I would say most of the patients I'm seeing. But that being said, some have had retina surgery, you know, if they had a retinal detachment, that oftentimes will buy you a cataract surgery within a couple of, you know, within a couple of years, because it just speeds that process along. Um, patients who have had uncontrolled diabetes may have it earlier if you've had trauma to the eye. Uh, but, you know, it's just important to kind of know the symptoms of cataracts, which is usually the vision's not correcting as well in glasses anymore, uh, especially if you can't get past that 2040, which is, you know, legal to drive all day and night, and then, or glare, glare, halos. So it's really whenever it's impacting, you know, your quality of life, are you feeling safe to drive or do certain things, you should get in and get a, a checkup. But I would say for most people, at least by age 50, they should be getting, you know, annual exams to screen for anything. Yeah. Uh, this person says her sister was diagnosed with a hole in her macula. What would cause this and how successful is surgery to repair this? So. A um, little more common in women, particularly over age 60, but often we don't know exactly what causes it. 
and fortunately we do have surgery to repair it. The surgery is over 90% effective at closing the hole. Um, once the hole is closed, vision tends to get a lot better, but it's not as good as it's gonna get until years after the hole is closed. It takes a long time for those photoreceptors to kind of line themselves back up. Um, and people often notice that the vision isn't quite perfect in the middle, but oftentimes it gets dramatically better once that hole is closed. You know, when we were talking about, you know, not smoking, so on and so forth, you know, sunglasses and protecting our eyes from the sun. You know, what, what are some of the problems that, that the sun can do to our eyes? So, I mean, when we're talking about cataracts, um, you know, sun exposure can definitely speed things up from a cataract side of things. Sun exposure into the eye, like anywhere else, um, could put you at risk for different skin issues, um, either like malignancies, different cancers, you know, around the eyelids themselves or even deeper in the eye. And so, you know, it's important just like you put on sunscreen to protect your eyes from the sun as well. This caller from Sioux Falls is having peripheral vision problems, is wondering what could be causing this and what potential treatments are. So very important to get an eye exam in this scenario. Um, it could be anything you know, as benign as a migraine. We think of things like glaucoma, retinal detachment, or even something systemic like a stroke. So very important to get evaluated. Uh, this, uh, when your eyes are bloodshot, is it good to use Visine or is there uh, a better drop to use? Yeah, so I recommend against using Visine, like I was talking about earlier. It helps to, you know, in the moment, make the eye less red, but your body kind of then has a rebound where once that wears off, it's going to get more red and you become almost dependent on these eye drops. So I recommend using uh, just more standard, just you know, not anything that's get the red away, <laughs> eye yeah. drops such as Refresh, Sustain, Blink. Again, I really like the preservative free ones um, because you can use them as often as you need to. But if the eyes are really red, it's also you know good to come in and have that evaluated. Sometimes there could be inflammation or something more going on in the eye that might need a different treatment. Um, we've talked some about a torn retina. This caller from Yankton recently tore his retina is wondering what the treatment options are. You know, you talked about some, some laser repair mm -hmm. and, and surgery. I mean, is there anything beyond that? So, no, that's that's the standard of care. Rare, rarely we'll freeze the tear instead of doing um, a laser, but getting that tear treated is important. And as soon as possible. Yes. Yeah. Uh, patient sees yellow tinge out of one eye and clear on the other. What should they do? Yeah, so that could be a cataract <laughs> forming in one eye over the other. Um, so it, it could be other things too though, so you know, to come in, have an eye exam. But certainly one of the things that will happen, and for some people it's so subtle they don't realize it until they get one of their cataracts out. And some, I've had patients call in concerned because they'll say everything looks different in this eye when I compare it to the other one. It looks more almost like blue, looks more blue. That's the color of the real world. You know, cataracts over time kind of can give you this more sepia tone and things can look a little bit more yellow. And so that would be the first thing that comes to my mind when you feel like you're seeing a difference between the color is it could be related to a cataract. Quick question, why do you not recommend omega-3 for dry eye? Or maybe we do. I, 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 I never say I don't recommend omega-3s. I think there's been some studies out there that have found it helpful for, for patients. It's making sure that you get kind of the right, you know, dosing of it. But dry eye, that might not be the case for everybody that it's due to their oil. You know, there's different reasons why your eyes are dry. And so for that individual, it might be that it isn't doing much because maybe they have a good oil flow, but maybe they're just not producing as much or maybe they're just more exposed, you know. But I don't think that there's any harm, you know, to taking the omega-3 vitamins. This caller from Minnesota is having the YAG laser procedure next week is wondering what the success rate is. What is that procedure? Yeah, so when I was talking about how after cataract surgery we put a new lens in. When we place the new lens in, it has this really thin capsule that wraps all the way around kind of the back of it to hold it into place. Over time that capsule itself can get hazy or form a film and so what we do with that YAG laser is we can zap 
we can zap it away. And it's very successful, uh, very successful. It's usually a one-time procedure. Every once in a while, you might, you know, when you come in at your one-month visit, notice that, oh, maybe there's a little tag that kind of gets back in the area again, and you can zap it away, and then it's done. But once you've cleared that back surface, it stays clear. Uh, so it's a very successful procedure. This caller from Miller recently was diagnosed with a wrinkle in his macula and was originally scheduled for a surgery to fix it, but the physicians decide not to go through with it. He is wondering what could have disqualified him from the procedure and what other treatments are possible. So macular pucker is something that's incredibly common. If we look at people who are 75, at least a quarter of people will have them in one eye or the other. And oftentimes they are asymptomatic. So my guess is that they didn't feel that he was having symptoms from this wrinkle in the retina, that maybe the symptoms were something else. Um, over time, those wrinkles can get better, they can get worse, they can stay the same forever. Um, certainly, if they are impacting your vision enough, oftentimes the benefits outweigh the risk and we can go in and take it out. But for the majority of people, they're not causing symptoms and so it's not worth taking the risk of surgery. Any other final words of advice? from 30 seconds from each of you. If you're having concerns about your eye, it's great to go ahead and get them examined. That's always a great first step. Yeah, and to have an eye exam even if you're not having symptoms because so many things can be found early. Yes, exactly. And then I think like we've, a, a theme we've talked about is just your overall health impacts your eyes, you know, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, any of these things we can see as, you know, systemically we can see in the eye. And so certainly doing everything to, to help your health overall, working with your primary care doctor too, if you're having issues with your blood sugars or, you know, anything like that, and definitely quitting smoking is a big thing too. Well, South Dakota is certainly lucky to have you, guys, you both here, and thanks for joining us and answering so many questions. You guys yes, did. thanks for having yeah, us. The winner of our prize tonight is Charlotte from Big Stone City. Thank you, Charlotte, for asking a question during the first 20 minutes of the show. A gift will be sent to you. We'll be right back after this. Looking for a source of trusted health information? Grab a copy of your local newspaper or read online the newest Prairie Doc Perspective, a weekly health and medical column. Head to prairiedoc.org to access all archive columns today. You may have been told to keep your eye on the ball. When batting, a baseball player is taught to watch the ball the entire time from when it leaves the pitcher's hand to when, hopefully, their bat smacks that ball for a hit. It may sound simple, but some pitchers can throw fast and sometimes they throw a curveball. Great hitters use their vision and spot the difference, helping them get a hit lose focus, and in the blink of an eye, the pitch has whipped past them for a strike. Like keeping your eye on the ball in baseball, I recommend you keep your eye on your eyes. Sure, you may have good vision, but that does not necessarily mean your eyes are in good health. It is important to see an eye doctor for a regular checkup to help spot any eye issues early. There are several common eye conditions that can be seen early by annual eye exams. Cataracts, macular degeneration, glaucoma, and diabetic retinopathy are some of the examples. Catching these right away helps to prevent or delay vision loss. Early detection allows for easier, more effective, and cost-efficient treatments. Cataracts are from clouding of the lens of the eye that can cause blurring and sometimes eventual blindness. Treatable with surgery, outcomes may be better when diagnosed early in the course. Macular degeneration is a problem with the retina, which can cause blurring and central vision loss. Early diagnosis and treatment help slow the course of the disease. Caused by increased eye pressure, glaucoma may lead to vision loss from damage to the nerve in the back of the eye called the optic nerve. Often people have glaucoma without knowing it until their vision slowly deteriorates. Once again, early detection is key for preserving vision. Diabetic retinopathy is a common complication from diabetes that causes damage to the blood vessels in the retina, causing vision loss. If you have diabetes or prediabetes, please have an annual eye exam and tell your eye doctor so they know to look for associated eye problems. 
Just like a baseball player needs to keep an eye on the ball to watch for changes in movement, I encourage you to get your eyes checked to detect changes in your eyes to prevent vision loss. So, next time you hear a baseball fan yell, get your eyes checked to an umpire, may it be a reminder to schedule your next eye exam. Thank you so much to our guests, Dr. Elizabeth Atchison and Dr. Andrea Bordewick for volunteering their time to help us learn more about good eye health. If you would like to see and hear more episodes of this program, please like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, or visit us at prairiedoc.org. Look for Prairie Doc Perspectives in your local newspaper and online, and listen to us live every Wednesday morning at 9.30 on KBRK Brookings. And be sure to look for the podcast of this program, Prairie Doc On Call, wherever podcasts can be found. From all of us here at On Call with Prairie Doc, thanks for joining us for another episode of health information based on science, built on trust. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. pain, heartburn, blood in your stool, or other gastrointestinal problems, a GI doctor services are invaluable. Digestion, absorption, and elimination of waste, GI issues. Next time, on call with the Prairie Doc. Hi, I'm Joni Holm. I'm the, on the board of directors of Healing Words. Well, there's so much to learn about our bodies. We take care of our cars in certain ways, we take care of uh, our houses and our lawns, but do we take care of ourselves? So by watching and learning, there's just so much to gain. I can think of so many examples with our guests talking about you know, how many times your heart beats a day and that if you don't take care of it, that, that machine is damaged and certainly our skin. We don't take care of our skin. So it's an education for everybody and there's so much to learn about our bodies. There's so much misinformation out there and there's so much advertising involved with medicine that it's hard to decipher what's true and what's not. And Rick believed in providing education without any bias. So he wanted the public to see the truth and be able to decipher on their own what was good for them and what wasn't. And an example of that is when a neighbor needed some information about uh, care for her father and not only Prairie Doc provides some background information, but it happened to be the physician her father was going to see. So. She learned about the illness. She learned about the physician by seeing him in our archives. Prairie Doc is a nonprofit. Our four Prairie Docs and our guest physicians all volunteer their time. People might think, well, why do I need to donate if it's a volunteer project? Well, there's a lot behind the scene. We've got the studio, we've got the time, we've got the cameras and the lights and the students that are involved in the production. It takes many, many hours for every show. And that's what your dollars as you donate go to. So we, we really need the support and we appreciate the support. For more information, go online, www.prairiedoc.org, and to donate, you can mail a check to our post office box at 752 Brookings, South Dakota, 57006, or you can go online. And there's on the top line, there's a little donate button. And we really would appreciate your donations because we couldn't do this, A, if you weren't watching and enjoying it, but B, if we didn't have the donations for the ongoing cost. Thank you for your support.
Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by. At Avera, our nationally recognized health system will be right here with you, with care and coverage. Hello, possibility. Hello, healthy. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, First Bank and Trust, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Vance Thompson Vision, Monument Health, Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings Madison Flandreau District Medical Society, The Pier District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Orthopedic Institute, Lake Ponset Sailing Academy, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications.